Entonces, boa tarde, buenas tardes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you all for joining. Um, uh, we we had uh, always good friends uh, every Wednesday. Uh, this Wednesday we had uh, Dr. Jeff Gam. He's an adult uh, pediatric spine surgeon at Letterman Spine Center in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, the, they are the lucky ones that are almost back to normal. He's doing surgery every day. Some of you <laughs> will be willing to do that. And um, uh, he's, um, he's a well-known speaker for Medtronic. He's been a speaker a couple of times in school to Sacrum. And um, I, uh, talking to him, I learned that uh, he, he's doing in his practice cortical screws uh, that we launched in Latin America a couple of years ago. And um, we want to bring back the idea. We want you to uh, get exposed to his experience, uh, what it's good for, um, how can you incorporate it into your practice? Uh, you can ask, it's not a revelation, but as we always said, it's another good tool in your, in your bag, the way you can treat your pa patients properly. So Dr. Gamp, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's very good to have you here. Time is yours. All right, thank you, Boris. And uh, thank you everybody for th this opportunity. Um, the, the goal of this is to meant to be um, interactive. So if there's questions that come through, Boris is going to stop me. It may chop up the flow a little bit, but uh, uh, the goal here is for me to be able to answer questions about CBT um, and really my story and how I incorporated it into my practice. You know, I, I had a discussion with uh, uh, with a few folks last week as far as technology and I realized that there's some limitations as far as my current technology versus what the rest of the world see. Um, but I could at least explain the, the rationale of how I got to where I am with regards to cortical bone trajectory. So here's my uh, disclosures. Um, so my story or my practice overview. Um, so I did residency where I'm currently at, which is five year orthopedic training. And then I went and spent a year with Larry Linky and Dan Rue and, and um, Ron Lehman and Bridwell. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be the last class before everybody, uh, before the math. But overall, my approach in residency and fellowship was was maximally invasive. There was no minimally invasive. There was no tubes. I did more PSOs in my training, um, and um, I really asked myself why I needed to incorporate these MIS techniques. And was it because the market was competitive? Not necessarily. Our group had uh, uh, the majority of the market share. Did I need to be competitive in the practice? Of course, there's always banter back and forth of who has better outcomes from partner to partner. Um, is there, did I feel that there was less complications with MIS? Definitely not during the learning curve process. And so, um, or were outcomes better? You know, in the end, I think they're pretty equivalent. We'll go through some of that as I progress. Was I bored with my practice? Definitely not, because I was just starting. So that's the last thing you're thinking about. But I've seen people switch techniques because of that. Um, uh, one thing that really struck me as, as a big change with these MIS type techniques, especially cortical screws, was improved recovery profile. So I feel like patients get back quicker, they're, uh, they're back to work, they're happier, especially in that, those first couple months. They're pretty equivalent at six months and one year, at least the literature shows, but we've seen the same thing at our center. So I was asking myself why, um, why I needed to incorporate new um, uh, new MIS type techniques. And, you know, when we start to think about traditional lumbar fusion, it's a pretty large incision where you beat up the muscle quite a bit um, and uh, quite a bit of blood loss. And then you need to ask yourself, really, what is MIS surgery? Is it endoscopic? Is it through a tube? Is it, um, you know, per fixation? Are you talking about uh, lateral uh, as far as A-lift, D-lift, O-lift, X-lift, all those types of things? And 
and so there's a, the spectrum of MIS is really all over the board. You know, as somebody that's a firm believer in this midline muscle sparing technique, I, I do consider midlift on the verge of MIS type techniques. It's not a true perk. It's not using a tube or an endoscope, but it is a, a good platform or springboard into more MIS te type techniques from my experience. The goals of MIS surgery, very similar to other type of lumbar fusions, right? So there's um, the, our goal is to get complete decompression of the neural element, stable fixation, and ultimately a solid orthodesis or fusion, and really to minimize the soft tissue damage. That's the goal. That's one of the, the, the important concepts of MIS. The other ultimate goal is uh, similar, better patient reported outcomes. We do a lot of outcome research at our center. And what we're finding um, is there's definitely an accelerated recovery and less pain to start with. Opioids in the US are a huge issue. It's not necessarily a worldwide issue, which I'm actually studying now, but uh, I, I live in an epicenter of uh, IV drug use and heroin use. We're actually on the cover of Time Magazine about two years ago. and so. We really focused our opioid reduction or minimization techniques, and uh, I'm a firm believer that MIS techniques really help with that. So advantages of less post-op pain, a shorter hospital stay, and lower narcotics with this accelerated rehab are things that were very interesting to me in ways that I can improve on my techniques. So why, why cortical bone trajectory. And the easiest, the first thing that comes to my mind when I'm having a live discussion with people is I had zero desire to introduce tubes to my practice. As somebody that did not have that formal training in, in residency and fellowship, I that leap to me seemed really far, right? I thought I was getting, I felt like I was getting pretty good outcomes with my open techniques. And so to go from maximally invasive training to operating through a tube, wearing lead and having a four scope in the room, uh, I just had zero desire to that. And so again, what led me to this CBT pathway was uh, I wanted MIS type techniques, but I wanted to get, not necessarily have the tube, tube in the room. And my partners were discussing this at conference. The fellows that were training with us were adopting it when they would rotate with me or come cover cases. They were talking about how they think they were gonna do it in practice. Once that went into practice, we're adopting the techniques. We really started uh, about the same time to put efforts into our enhanced recovery or ERAS uh, initiatives and focused on length of stay. And the biggest difference that I saw immediately was patients were getting out of the hospital quicker. They're up walking the same day versus sitting around or laying around to the next day. And these were my partner's patients. And so, of course, as a competitive person, um, I, I started to pay more attention to it and adopt uh, adopt this technique. Additionally, I was starting to have more and more higher profile patients versus uh, uh, that were referred to me. And so I wanted to be able to offer them something that I felt was a, a competitive advantage to get them back quicker. So uh, I started to perform CBT, CBT and mid lifts. And, you know, to me, it's a very familiar approach. It's a laminectomy exposure, right? That, so you don't need to go past the facets unless there's some nuances to that, depending on what you want to do. Your decompression, it could be unilateral, bilateral. You could take care of central, lateral, foraminal issues directly visualizing, right? So again, the, the, as a person that did not get trained or facile on these tubular decompressions, I, I was not too interested early in my career to introduce that or to, to study that. So it's a very similar approach. You're already doing a laminectomy type approach. Inner body fusion, you, you can get access to the inner body space through, through this. We do it with discectomies all the time. So it wasn't a big change with that. You could get good segmental bone fixation. I'll go through some of the literature of, of uh, how I think that fixation is actually more robust than our traditional pedicle screws, depending on the bone quality. So I start to adopt the technique. So, uh, you know, Jackson table, radio lucent, make sure you can get excellent AP and lateral radiographs. I prefer, I prefer the Jackson four post versus a Wilson frame. And I started off using uh, for, for, foroscopy. So no navigation, no robotics. And 
uh, it's typical draping. I localized my skin incision. I would use a spinal needle. Uh, I started with local anesthetic. I do that at the end of the case. Now I'm happy to discuss some of the uh, differences or things that have changed. Skin incision at the time was about four centimeters. And so that's it's, it's still for single level fusion, not the smallest incision in the world, but it's progress. I'm progressing in the direction of smaller and smaller exposure. It's, that was pretty dependent on patient size. You dissect down Make sure you confirm that you're at the right level. Expose your inner laminal space. And do, do, don't dissect that cranial facet, which we preserve anyway in an open T lift or open posterior lateral fusion. And typically, from a school a screw hole prep, I'll go through some of the things that are involved in my practice. I used a matchstick burr to start. Um, I then transitioned to a two millimeter ball because I felt there was a little less shatter, and you didn't get a, such a big a hole to start. But um, the goal, if I was doing a single level, was to prepare all the tracks, do that under fluoroscopy. I would put my contralateral fixation in, right? If I'm going to T lift on the left, I put my right sided screws in and I leave the left sided screws out. I would go ahead and tap. Um, essentially, just like putting acetabular pelvic fixation, and I used that burn kind of slowly went in millimeter or two at a time to feel that I was in bone. And then after that, I went to either a freehand Steffi type probe or Linky type probe um, and or a tap. And I, that went back and forth based on uh, the different taps I was playing with. But typically I would start with a dimple just below the cranial facet, about two, two or three millimeters on the pars. I would make this little dimple and then place my burr there and uh, get a, a lateral fluoroscopic images to help guide that pathway. And typically it's about 10 degrees lateral. It's not a huge uh, up and out. The cranial screws, even in my current technique, are, are more aggressively cranial and lateral uh, as far as direction goes. Once you start to get into your distal segments, um, I've really transitioned to getting away from starting below the facet and doing a trans facet screw. And I'll, I'll show you where that evolved in my practice it really helps minimize incision when you do that but i would palpate with a ball tip feeler uh when i started i tap line to line then i started under tapping by a millimeter now i try not to tap if i don't have a breach and there's no issues with it i actually don't tap as long as the the jump from whatever i'm using to cannulate the pathway to the screw isn't isn't uh too large from a sh sh screw starting perspective i'll go through the screw that i currently use um and 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 a screw that I think is great for this and a screw that I think is going to uh, it's going to make all this very easy for us in the future, which is hopefully a year, uh, a year or so out, if not less than that. Um, the, 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 the ipsilateral side that I'm not putting the screws in, I would put flow seal or gel foam in there so it doesn't ooze throughout the decompression portion of the, the case. Here's a, a couple of fluoroscopic images, um, trial um, or disc prep, and then the cage going in. And here's the final construct, right? So I like to cage anteriorly as much as possible, especially if I'm trying to restore the lordosis. I may slide it back a little bit if I'm not too concerned about the segmental alignment. And it's uh, the screws are uh, up and out, as you can see, uh, definitely more on the cranial level versus the distal level. Then along, comes navigation. Our center uh, really embraced navigation over the past decade. And so um, we, you know, when I was a fellow, I kept hearing the Medtronic team tell how slick uh, uh, navigation was. And before I left, it was kind of this complete pain in the rear to drag the ORM in and drag it out and drape it. And what we found is our team become very facile with that. And the more they got, they bought into that type of technology, the more excited the room was to bring it in. And, and now all of a sudden we have this live, uh, this real time GPS setup that's showing us our anatomy, which is really important to focus on when you're planning cortical type screws, because there's a couple types of canals that are not very favorable for this. And, and figuring that out interop is not the funnest thing in the world because you've always done your exposure and you realize that it's gonna be hard to get a screw in that pathway. But uh, navigation um, um, got the floor scope out of our room, um, which I was a little bit excited about, but I was more excited about getting the lead off of myself. And so when we, when we do an ORM spin, 
would typically go all stand behind a, a lead shield, which uh, makes it more comfortable during the procedure because I was not a fan of constantly sweating throughout the day with all the lead on. Group consists of eight people. Um, four of us really embraced mid lifts or cortical screws. I mean, if you look at our OR board, which is typically 20 to 30 spine cases a day, there's probably 15 uh, uh, mid lift or cortical screw type cases. The four young guys, uh, younger or, or less wise is probably a better way to say it. The four less wise guys in the group uh, really embraced this technique and uh, fell in love with it. But at the same time, the whole group embraced um, OR in navigation. And so what I found is now we're sharing toys, right? So we get this new fancy uh, navigation. We even buy two of them. We buy like five or six stealth machines. And every day if somebody's arguing about who gets the stealth machine when and how, and people are calling earlier than they need them and keeping them in the room. So it's kind of nasty. I realized my partners that I love to death and uh, done a great job getting me up to speed in, in my practice, um, don't play well in the sandbox um, when there's that, that many of us and that much volume. And so this whole time I was interested in robotics and, um, had a, felt like robotics is going to be a big part of what spine surgery looks like in the future. And for me, the applications of robotic assisted surgery was really the springboard into enabling M MIS. Right. So I felt that it could lead me down the path of potentially perk. It could, it could help with my workflow of cortical screws, right? It wasn't just adding a step. It was replacing navigation or it was replacing fluoro. So I became very interested in, in uh, obtaining a robotic system. So I spent 18 months arguing with my hospital system of why we need a robot. You know, it was from kicking and screaming to similar what my five-year-old five would do during a temper tantrum to me trying to come up with good business plans. But ultimately, I had to understand the hospital's return on investment, why they would purchase such a system. So we agreed to a 20-case trial. I slid, a, slid in two extra cases. Um, and the goal was to show them that the economics per case, I wasn't just going to add cost to these cases. And so when I knew I had 20 cases or 22 cases to do, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show them that there was economic value for this. And so at first, as somebody interested in economics and spine surgery, especially deformity, at first I um, thought that deformity cases would be a great way to do this. But um, the downfall to deformity, if there were issues, if the cases were, you know, if I did a T2 to the pelvis and that patient had a PE or a DVT or a wound infection or a PJF, the, my hospital would just look at the, the figures on the paper and blame the robotic system. So uh, I started to think about the perfect case and I was like, well, I'm really getting into these cortical screws. And so I, I cherry picked all 20 of the, 22 of those cases and did cortical screws or robotic assisted mid lifts. And what, what I found was a beautiful marriage. And I really fell in love with the procedure at this point once I started to incorporate some of that technology. The other thing was it um, allowed me at my, my new toy in the sandbox that nobody else was going to use. Um, similar to some of the discussion of why I said that I was introducing tubes or new nice tech type techniques, my partners were pretty slow to adopt any of the robotic systems. So for a while there, I find myself the only one using the system and they're all over there still fighting about the arm. So it's pretty happy about uh, that decision-making process. I'll go through a couple cases and then uh, we'll go, go through some of the literature and then I want to spend the, the remaining portion of the time really to answer questions uh, uh, that people have about introducing this technique. So. 56 year old, um, uh, about eight to nine year history of back and left leg pain. It was uh, about 50, 50 back versus leg, failed at all the non-operative treatment, was having uh, claudication type symptoms as well. ODI 60 and uh, back versus leg is about eight and eight. No other spine surgery, so native spine, diabetic, uh, not the best control, but uh, A1C is not too high. If you look here, there's a grade two spondy, uh, segmentally kyphotic at that level. A little bit of rotatory subluxation as well. If you look at the MRI, that spondy reduces um, reduces some, as you would expect on the axial images. There's lateral recess stenosis, and so mobile grade two spondy. Um, in, in my mind, this is a home run for a small incision. Um, 
cortical screws with inner body fixation or in, in, with a with a T lift. The if it's not mobile and I need correction, you know, a lot of the questions that stem from some of these talks is when don't you use cortical screws? And right now, with the, it would be nice if I had a couple of images, but a grade two or higher spondy that I need to reduce. If I really need to change the alignment, I feel like that muscle envelope needs to be dissected a little bit more. I probably need to decompress a little bit farther. That's easy uh, through a smaller incision. So a non-mobile spondy that I need to bring back and really reduce is one, one reason why, uh, one case I avoid cortical bone trajectory and go to traditional pedicle screws. Number two is if the pars de if there's it's an ismic spondy and the pars defects tracks up into the pedicle. Uh, we've had a couple cases where it's really difficult to get good purchase because that defect extends up in the pedicle. That's not very common for that to happen, but those are the two biggest reasons why I, I say, no, nah, I think I'm gonna have to do this uh, with traditional fixation and a much bigger dissection. So my plan was a robotic assisted midlift at four or five. Here was my robotic plan. In, in when I show these robotic planning portions, it's not just, you know, I, I, obviously I'm, I'm in love with robot and can talk for days about that as well. But folks that don't have access to it, it the thing that I learned about going to NAV and robotics was one of the biggest benefits is I was forced to plan. I have to look at my images more critically versus just show up and say, oh yeah, I looked at it in the office, I'm, it's gonna work out. And so because of that, um, because of that forced pre-op planning, I've understood my fixation and where it's gonna land um, uh, a, a lot more thorough nowadays. And so one of the things that you'll see here is my fixation intersects on, that, on the skin. So that brown line on the sagittal image on the right, shows that the screws, uh, the trajectory of the screws intersect. And if you think about it, if you go into these cases, you actually have a ton of real estate in that sagittal plane. We have to avoid the cranial facet, right? And one of the benefits of this is, to, is less impingement on your UIV facet or your cranial facet. But the level below, you're fusing. That facet, you know, I used to avoid that with, um, I think, yeah, I used to, so the image on the left, was how I used to start out. You know, my, my cortical screw constructs were up and out at both levels. And those don't intersect on the skin. So I was making a smaller incision compared to my open cases, but it was still not as small as it could be. So I just changed the trajectory of that distal screw and make it converge on the skin where the cranial screws uh, intersects on the skin. And you end up going through the facet and you're fusing the facet. Granted, I prep it um, and, and, and still end up putting graft in it and decorticate it, et cetera. But that's one of the biggest things that changed when I went from uh, a fluoro case, fluoro, fluoro base to navigation and robotics. And if I were to go back and use fluoro, I would still do the same trajectory and just think about it in a different aspects. So I learned a lot transitioning from there. Here's a, uh, a, a pre-op image, so robotic systems mounted to the bed uh, versus if fluoroscope was in there, that's fine, I would already have it there. I use a needle to localize where those screws would intersect on the skin, right? We can see that we already have a little bit of reduction of the spondy at that, uh, that image. Uh, this is me just showing me mounting the robotic system, and here's the final construct. So uh, reduction of the spondy, which was not even needed or intentional, a T lift. I didn't put it all the way up front because it was a pretty high grade slip to start with, and uh, cortical fixation. And you know, some of my uh, I actually showed this to one of my co fellows, and the d deformity mindset. He's like, "Man, I was pushing. You know, I thought I, I maybe need to grab a level above, a level below, potentially go to the pelvis with a spondy like that that was mobile. And you know, I've now progressed with these with this cortical fixation and. Uh, I've been very happy with things that in the past, I didn't think the fixation would be as robust. Here's pre to post-op, you can see we improved the segment, segmental kyphosis at this level. Another case, a little bit more extensive, this is really pushing the, the boundaries that I've, I've kind of set up where I uh, uh, 
uh, feel comfortable with cortical fixation. So 10 year history of back and leg pain, uh, uh, similar failed all non-operative treatment, similar ODI and VAS profile. Uh, she had a mitral valve replacement, so uh, we can't do an MR on her. So I did a CT myelogram. You could see disc lapse at 5.1, um, uh, uh, grade one, uh, spondy at four or five and uh, less of a grade one spondy at three, four. If you look at our myelogram, you can see she's really tied at four or five and, and uh, moderate, uh, moderately tied at three, four and pretty bad disc collapse at five, one. If you look at the parasagulals at five, one, she does have pretty bad foraminal stenosis at five, one. So my plan uh, at this point in my career, I was a massive fan of uh, anterior workout 5-1. If I had to do workout 5-1 and I could get to it from the front, that was pretty much my go-to. Um, and so my second stage was cortical screws in the back from L3 to S1. I knew I was going to T-lift 4-5 based on one of the facets that uh, I, need, I wanted to remove and potentially 3-4, which is a, another topic that I'm happy to discuss. And that's cortical screws without the interbody portion of it. So it's a mid lift without the lift. So it's the cortical screws, which is, uh, I use a little bit of a hybrid technique and been happy and it's a pretty select uh, group of folks that I use that in. So did the a lift at 5.1 um, and did my robotic CT afterwards to plan. And then here's my robotic plan. And so one, I made sure all the tulips line up in the coronal plane. Right, so when, when I place my rod in, there's uh, I'm not having a fight with that. The axial image in the center shows that it's truly a trans facet screw distally, right? So granted that facet has been prepped, it's flat, it's not, you know, I remove any overgrowth or big spurs, uh, but it literally goes through the facet and we're uh, then able to make them all converge onto the skin, which really minimizes our incision. So eight screws, I got to visualize every level from a decompression perspective. I got to visualize the starting point for all my screws. And we did this through a seven and a half centimeter incision. So she was up walking uh, about two and a half hours after, after the case and went home the next day. And so here's a video that's about two minutes long. So it's four views. Upper left is straight down. Upper right is the plan portion of it. And then a couple other views of things going in. So here's my cannula. Here's the navigation component of, 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 of the system. So if you look in the upper right, there's a teal plan screw that goes through the facet. So this is kind of mid-construct mid screw. You can see that the live drill bit that goes in, um, that didn't show up on the nav, but the, the uh, tap will show up. It'll overlay the actual plan that I have. So I get to see my plan. I could just see the real-time instruments go over that plan and show me that I'm going down the same trajectory right there. So it's me depth is the same. Um, and then move on to the, the, um, the screw. So if you noticed, I tap there. I, I, I don't like to tap. I don't like to waste the time if I don't need to waste the time. But the drill bit that I use to cannulate through the system is a 3-0 drill bit. When I go up to anything larger than a 5.5 five Solera screw, which is what I use, that it's that 3.0 to 6.5 jump is too big and that screw dances a little bit. And I don't like that. And so if it's the if it's larger than a 5.5 five screw, I tap. And that and from a workflow perspective, whether I was doing 4.0 nav or robotic assisted, I would still do the same thing until the newer system comes out, which is going to make this uh, a, a lot easier for us. Here's the final construct. So uh, A-lift, T-lift, and then a level. So that you, you kind of get an experience of all three levels. So A-lift, T-lift, and then no inner body fixation. Again, all through seven and a half centimeter incision. She's about 14 months out, went back to golf at three months and love and life. So uh, literature, Boris, if, if there's questions that you want me to stop and address, I'm happy to right now. Otherwise, we're, I'll keep plugging along and go through some of the literature. That's good. I, let's make a quick stop. I have some questions that um, surgeons have made to me through the time, but I have some online yep. here. Um, okay. um, first one, Dr. Pablo Sanchez. Thank you, doctor, for your conference. Greetings from Colombia. 
in your experience, have you faced that the final pedicle screw trajectory is different than the trajectory planet by navigation system? If I have, if I take the time to plan either on nav or robotic systems, those end up pretty close to similar. The times I've had to change them is when our, our skin incision is smaller than what's actually required either for the robotic arm to guide us in or for me to get the angle that I plan. And so at that point, I'll audible and I'll change a little bit. But overall, if I look at the trend that I've, from when I started these to where I'm at now, the besides the UIV, right, that is still has to be up and out pretty aggressively to miss that cranial facet. But the rest of them are be, have become a lot more straight in and trans facet. And my most common size of cortical screw is not the 4525 described or the 4530. It's a 6540. That is my most common screw placed as in a cortical screw trajectory. And that's 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 what changed, that's one of the biggest changes when I started because. I always plan, I, I, I would look at the anatomy in the office, we would go look at it a little bit as we're doing the case, but when you were forced to plan on a system, be it nav or a robotic system, the lessons I've learned from that, I would take that to uh, fluoro and really study that pedicle anatomy. And you can get very large screws in, but you just have to make, it, it may be a little atypical of what it's described and the starting point might change a little bit. You know, what I've found, I actually start a little closer to the edge of the pars. And so, yeah, I, 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 I'm not changing my plan as, as much, but I have definitely changed it in the evolution of me doing these cases. Great, thank you. Second question, you, you talked about the, the um, size of screw that surprised me because back then I remember it was 4045. So now yeah. you, I mean, it's okay to use 4045. You use 65 because you get better fixation, I guess. Yeah, yeah. What about the length? Yeah, 40, 40 millimeters is the most common length that I'll use. So 6540. That's the, it. I would say, I would say the cranial screw is typically a little bit smaller in diameter and a little bit smaller in length. Okay. But, and that's just because we brought that starting point down a little in lengthwise, most of the time that cranial disc is your rate limiting step for, for length. But if you think about the distal level or middle levels within the mm -hmm. construct and you're going through the facet, now you're going in that lateral view you're going down the, the, the you're going a very similar trajectory as an open pedicle screw or classic pedicle screw. So the length is now dictated by the shape of the vertebral body, right? And then some mm -hmm. people have these elongated bodies, but six five forty is definitely the most common screw that uh, size that I put in doing these now. And now I wasn't even close to that when I started. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, it's a, it was a surprise for me. So, Dr. Vasan is asking here from the uh, biomechanics standpoint, um, if we compare a regular pedicle screw with the cortical screw, what is the difference on the pull-out strength? Yeah, great, great question. Let's team me up for the next uh, next few slides. <laughs> okay, and, so and, you're gonna go and, in and say, okay, let's go to the following yeah. one. Can you tell us about your sagittal planning correction before the surgeries, Jorge Salazar? Yeah, and so I've, I've you know, spent a lot of time in the ISSG. Um, uh, I'm involved in ISSG, so I'm a big believer in, in uh, the LR, LLPI mismatch and trying to make sure that's within the appropriate sagittal parameters. You know, to me, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how mobile or flexible the segment is and and i also you know if you look at the deformity principles of where we were and where the pendulum swung to so aggressive and paying so much attention to ll-pi and segmental lordosis that and now we're coming back down and have these age alignment thresholds etc so you know i pay attention to that segment the first thing i ask myself do i need to improve on alignment I know I don't, I shouldn't make it worse, right? That no, no, you know, T-lift is almost a kyphosing procedure if you're not paying attention and doing the carpentry work. So I want to number one, make, not make it worse. Then I want to ask myself, do I need to improve on this? And if I need to improve on this, 
I spend more time with the T lift prep. I spend more time with the contralateral facet. I'm taking the facet out. You know, I do a T lift, not a, a plift. So I'm already taking the ipsilateral facet out. So I just spend more time on on the opposite prep. The other thing I found that a lot of times positioning, right? So spreading my pads out a little bit on the Jackson table, Kentucky patients have a lot bigger bellies than the rest of the world. And that the advantage of that in this situation is that actually helps with my lordosis once I've done some of the release. So I, I you know, this is not, I, I, I love this procedure and I'll promote the hell out of it. But one of the limitations, if you need monster correction or a significant correction and it's not mobile, it's, it's tough. You can get it by resecting both facets, but then your, your only fusion surface is what? Your inner body, right? And so, it, and that's going to set you up by giving away both facets and just relying on your inner body. You can get the correction, but maybe not the best use if, if somebody needs a lot of correction at one level. Okay. We have a couple of more questions. You want to move on with uh, your presentation and we do it at the end? Is that okay? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So if you look at the literature, without a doubt, it's the, the publications are going through the roof. But one thing that's a little interesting uh, when I started to put some of these talks together over the last few years is, what do we what do we even call this right so cortical bone trajectory that makes sense mid lift mid lift with an eye mid lift without an eye midline um mini open cbt so depending on how you search the literature it's really all over the board with regards to how it's indexed so but without a doubt the last two to three years the literature has really exploded um the and what the first thing I'm going to get to is fixation. So fixation uh, currently, and I'll jump back to the actual study. So cortical screws versus traditional screws, right? So in my mind, as a previous carpenter, I'm thinking wood screw versus metal screw, or wood screw versus concrete type screw. And there's a difference in the major minor ratios in the pitch between the two, right? So this image shows a difference between cortical and traditional. In in do I think that makes a difference? I do in specific type of bone but your fixation is so good you can almost use you know it uh, the screw is important to make our life easier and maximize fixation but if it's somebody that doesn't have osteoporotic bone the uh, the screws that are available now work fantastic this is an image of a solaris screw uh, uh, and i typically use the 475 uh, setup if it's three levels or a big mail, or I need to work the system a little bit and, and paying attention to correction, I will go to a five five, but that tulip gets a little big in the midline portion of it. Um, I do love the ATS, but you know, as other areas, they, it, the cost of that. And so at my center, it was more expensive. And as somebody that does a lot of economics research, uh, and I'm a firm believer in this, it wasn't worth the additional value for for the premium on the screw. So I use Solera 475 and I love it. It's, it's, I'm not seeing failures at the screw bone interface unless there's a reason for it. Kentucky has a ton of smokers and we're trying not to operate on the majority of them, but um, that's a big part of it. Ideally, the system is modular. And when I say modular, the shanks get placed heads pop on at the end. That way you get your fixation and you can distract off of them if you need to for your inner body work or decompressive work and then the heads pop on at the end and it's all quarter and that is, that's in the works, right? And we're working on a name for it, but Medtronic will have that at some point in the future. Um, I wish it was two years ago, but um, it, it's coming. I can't give you a date, but it, it's out there. And it's gonna make, what's gonna come with this system is also retractors that are specifically designed for this. It's going to come with light sources that are specifically designed for it. It's going to come with screw-to-screw -screw distraction that's specifically designed for it. So I'm very excited uh, excited for the release of this. The biomechanical study, this is the classic one. This was the original promoter. So Rick Hines, the Santani, Santani article, which showed that in osteoporotic bone, when you compare a 6550 versus a 4530, the cortical screw fixation was still more robust, 
right? And that's a, that's a huge, in my mind, there's a lot of flaws and uh, you could shoot holes in a lot of biomechanical studies, but when you're comparing a 6550 versus a 4530, out of the gate, you, you, you're setting yourself up for uh, uh, not the best results, but it still showed, especially in bad bone, that this, the fixation, the pullout strength was more superior. Right. This biomechanical study that I want to see, which I haven't seen, is does that toggle, is the toggle less forgiving? Right. So if there's if there's a, a delayed union or they don't, um, it, it's not a super robust fixation, that cortical pathway, some people say that that's way less forgiving for more bone on growth or in growth down the road if that continues to toggle. So that I haven't seen a study that's looked at that portion of it, but the pullout strength is better. Our center, I was interested in looking at the index episode of care parameters. So that's EBL, length of stay, and cost of these patients. And so what uh, this was a NAS presentation last year. So I took uh, one to two level lumbar fusions for degenerative conditions. At the time I had 52 robotic assisted mid lifts. I had 214 navigated mid lifts and 281 uh, traditional T lifts. And we compared all, we propensity matched the robotic assisted ones to the navigated to the traditional T lift. And we matched on age, gender, BMI, Asia grade smoking, number of levels and diagnosis. Um, if you look at it across the board, so if you go from traditional T lift to navigated mid lift to robotic assisted mid lift, we saw a decrease in EBL across all three. We saw a decrease in OR time across them. Uh, the navigated and robotic assisted were very close. I didn't have enough of the floor, floor um, uh, the floro mid lifts to include in this. Length of stay went down as well. If you look at cost at our center, the navigated mid lift was the cheapest. And that was, uh, even though the robotic assisted cohort had less length of stay, we made up for it in, um, and navigated because it was less disposables open during the case. And so, but if you look at just, if you group just the mid lifts together, right, there's a big difference between EBL, OR time, length of stay, and overall mid lifts were soap and there was a decrease in cost. This is just a graphical form of that. And so, you know, one of the goals of the study is as we layer in enabling technology and there's a big capital cost, I want to make sure we're not just adding more cost and not improving on the outcome. So we are improving on the value equation. The literature, so I, uh, uh, you can go through a, a lot of different perspectives of the studies, but this is a pretty recent one published in World neurosurgery that took all, searched all these different terms of where CBT would fall into place. And that they included 109 articles. And in those 109 articles, they had about 28 biomechanical studies, right? They had about um, 29, sorry, 57 surgical technique studies. And then they had 42 clinical studies, right? So it's a good analysis of what's out there. What's interesting, if you look at these lists, which is not the easiest thing to, to read, almost all of this really starts in about 2014 or 2015, right? Which tells me that the trend of this, well, not just in the US, but worldwide is really starting to pick up. And one thing that I've always argued with uh, Medtronic is they this is a procedure, you know, you see uh, when Medtronic releases something, there's a pretty big push nationally and internationally. And it's, this has been talked about, but it hasn't been a big, a big promotion, um, at least in my opinion to this point, but yet it's still gaining traction, right? It's still gaining traction from a study perspective, from a conversation perspective, when I start to talk about it with other surgeons. And so I think with a new system, that addresses needs specific for this, it's gonna really, it, it's, it, people are gonna love it, right? And so people that start to dabble in are gonna see and they're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense and, and makes my life a lot easier. Um, plus any enabling technology uh, adds the value component of real-time navigation or robotics. But the conclusions of that review study show that it was safe and valuable uh, for, from the screw fixation perspective. The bone is more dense on the biomechanical studies, so the fixation's better. Techniques have improved and show that the safety is at least equivalent, but all these studies are level two and three. And so 
the dilemma our centers talked about three years about doing an RCT for it. The problem is, is the mid lift users say, I don't want to go back to open if I don't have to go back to open. And the open guys are like, well, I don't want to learn how to do this. And typically the, the, the folks that are opposed to learning the mid lift, uh, at least at our center, are the ones that are a lot closer to their retirement than I am. Uh, and so we've had this internal debate of we would love to do an RCT, but there's uh, nobody wants to go backwards or, or, or vice versa. So overall, for me, it's my go to for one to three level lumbar cases, right? It's it, it, unless I find a, a reason not to, which is really big correction at that level. I've used floor, I've used nav, I've re used robotic assisted. I think all three techniques are, are easy to reproduce. Um, uh, for personal reasons, I try to get the floor and the lead off of me. Um, starts, you know, the, the midline to outward trajectory really allows you to optimize your incision, especially if you think about it pre-incision, right? Make your trajectories converge on the skin. Get a pre-op lateral x-ray to figure out where that, that spot is and center your incision over that. I think this reduces variability, which is a massive issue with spine cases. And we've shown that you can improve length of stay, EBO, OR time, and the literature is reflecting this. And there's a ton of studies showing that this is beneficial and, and, and potentially superior than open cases. And our, I think our new system that's gonna be out in the future is gonna make life e even easier. So CBT is here to stay and gonna be a big part of the future in my opinion. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, great presentation. And um, I had some questions that I picked from your presentation. Why you use the flow seal for? Yeah, that was for flow seal or gel foam if you, or wax, bone wax. If you cannulate the pedicles or yeah. the CBT trajectories, plug them if you're not going to put something in them. So, you know, if you cannulate it, leave it open, and then you go to your decompression um, uh, um, or your T-lift prep, uh, just put, put something over it so you're not oozing through the whole case. Got it. The, the one question that I, I get from, from surgeons often is, what happens if, if you don't have a high-speed drill? How you do it? Yeah, if you don't have a, a burr, Yep. If you don't, yeah, if you don't have a bird, you could do it with a hand drill and, and a hand drill is actually more controlled, but the down, the, the part that's most difficult without that is getting through that initial cortical bone, right? Yeah. So if you, in a, in a um, traditional pedicle, you can prep down to cancel a bone to get started, right? And this, once you get started with the drill, it's not too bad. Um, if you did it by hand, but that initial prep, that PARS is not, you know, the, one of the benefits of this approach, PARS stays the same, right? The facets overgrow, a lot of other things change with, with aging of the spine, but the PARS is the PARS. That's very rarely altered unless there's a, a, a defect in it. So th that's hard to prep to get a good starting point, but you could do it with a hand drill. I've done it done in the past waiting on a bird because they were taking too long to get at my room yeah. it's just it, it, it's not as easy that's for sure beautiful um another question what will be the contraindications for critical screws when you will walk out of of midleaf yeah so for me it's um big correction right? So where I need more soft tissue release, release and carpentry work than I could get through a limited exposure. And then the other part of it is, um, I'm trying to go back, is when the defect extends into the pedicle, if there's an isthmic defect, that's the second one. The other one is if you look at the axial view of, a, of the canal, let's see if I can find an image here. There are some so if you look at the axial view there you see how it's almost a triangle there are some canals where it's call it a trefoil canal where that really widens out and it's much more of a triangle and if you if you see that and start to pay attention to it sometimes you have really little real estate and that's where you get the 20 millimeter screw in length and four or five and you can still do it, but your fixation's not as robust. And so if the bone's not great, 
and I see that canal where it's very triangular, um, it's more favorable for a traditional pedicle trajectory. Okay. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, you said that it's your, your, your um, system of preference for the two to three levels. What would be like a, a maximum quantity of levels that you can do with, with cortical screws? Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen people, um, I've seen people push it to four or five. I've seen some people, I've seen some x-rays that are deformity, um, which is, in my opinion, I think that's pushing it a little too much. But okay. um, it, it, one thing that is not rate limiting, so I don't think it's necessarily the, the exact numbers of levels, but one thing that is not limiting is pelvic fixation. Right? So okay. I, I do S2AI uh trajectories for my pelvic fixation this lines up beautifully for that right so okay. you know what if your your s2ai tulips typically end up more medial than your open pedicle screws right and you either have to put a little band or really plow those pet those uh the s2 s2ai tulips into the in the back of the sacrum which is not that big a deal but sometimes it's hard to get the rod in so if i have four to pelvis Right, and for some reason, I want it. It's not massive correction, and 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 I've done cortical screw constructs, and it lines up beautifully. The tulips actually line up better for S two AI fixation. So, to me, if it's over three, I think you're pushing a little bit. I'm not saying don't do it, but in my experience, it just seems like you're working it working it quite a bit. The other part okay. of it is your your fusion surface, right? To me, it's not just the fixation, but you know, if you're doing anterior work at all those levels, that's fine. That's a different story. But I have a, a threshold of if it's over two levels of T-lift, um, for some reason, it is not as enjoyable of a case for me. I'd rather okay. do a big T2 to the pelvis. So to me, it's the interbody work in that many levels. You got it. Okay. So we have a, an interesting question here. Dr. Carlos Aguero is asking... Uh, what about use this technique at the end or the cranial uh, end of a long construction construction in osteoporotic patients? For PJK prevention, I guess I would assume that's, that's what he's asking. I, I, I that is a ph phenomenal idea. I, I, um, if you look in the world of PJK or P, PJF prevention, there is. We're, we're not doing a good job overall with that. And I think minimizing soft tissue dissection and even potentially transitioning from a 5.5 or larger system to a smaller, less diameter system, right, with a center construct that attaches to a, long, a wider construct is a great idea. I've tried it a couple times, uh, not enough to publish, and I've had side conversations with people, but that. That's a really good idea, and I've used it twice and loved it. There you go. Um, yeah. There's a, a last question. I don't get it. What do you do with a patient that's... with a less T score to five? Yeah, so osteoporotic patient. So, okay. the, yeah, and so to me, the, the, I, we have a lot of poor bone health management in our area. And for the most part, I do everything I can to improve their, if they're minus 2.5, which, um, and we can de get through this a ton. One, I am always checking Hounsfield units on a CT to see if that matches. And to me, if it's below 100, it's, it, it matches up well with the minus 2.5. I'm always looking at the femoral neck and I'm looking at the absolute value, not necessarily the T-score. And if okay. it's below, if it's below, 0.65 the the I think it's, I think it's grams per centimeter cubed on the DEXA. There, I try to stay away from it. But if I have to do fixation, I actually prefer this because of the pullout strength versus an open screw, traditional okay. screw. Okay, this one Spanish is gonna try to translate for you. So he thank you for your presentation. He like it and he says. He asks if you do bone scan routinely before surgery, or, or you just do it on all your patients. A de uh, it, uh, so I do a DEXA scan okay. on es essentially, which I, I think that's a, 
what he's asking. Any female over 60, I will do a DEXA scan, right? If they've had a history of steroid use, smoking, et cetera, or other factors for osteoporosis, I'll do it. If the x-ray or image, if the x-ray in the office looks, you know, even though it's not a good quantitative way, if it just looks like it's poor bone quality, I do a DEXA scan a lot. So okay. it, my, but I've also used the CT scan as much as I can. It's that pre-screening okay. because we have issues with insurance paying for DEXA scans. You know, my 50 year old male, it's not, a lot of times they don't want to pay for it. So I'll use the Helmsfield unit on the CT scan to determine whether I really need a DEXA. Okay. Okay. And the last part of the question says, if you evaluate uh, by x-ray or other means, uh, your screws after surgery, just to check if they move or loose or anything. Yep. So I do a flat plate x-ray. Even if I use fluoro during the case, either um, my final image before I leave is a, a AP and lateral x-ray. I, I feel like I can visualize it better. I also, I like to stem these screws with EMG. Um, some of my partners will do an O-arm spin to confirm, right, which is, which is fine. And we've actually done a cost benefit analysis of which is cheaper uh, overall. And I, I think the O-arm was a tad bit cheaper than the cost of neuromonitoring, but the radiation dose to the patient to have a second spin, in my opinion, is a little high if you don't need it. So I do an x-ray to check in, instead of four. Okay, um, one more question, Dr. Malieiros. For patients with prior instrumentation and adjust, adjacent level disease, um, it is possible to put the cortical screws in the middle of the two old uh, regular pedicle screws. Yeah, it's, um, that's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult technically, and a lot of times you don't have as much real estate. I think for an adjacent segment, right? So if I need to extend somebody up because they've broken down at, at uh, say I've done a four to one fusion and three, four looks bad. I now, my go-to construct is cortical screws at the new level, and then I'll either domino on into the old system mm -hmm. or I remove the old system old stuff and I put the instead of having an altered pathway at my distal level I put the traditional one in as long as it's one construct and the rods still line up great because it's one level right if it's multiple levels that you have to extend it up uh, you're going to have to domino into the old system and that's that's a good point the new the new system that is going to come out is drastically improve the connector connectors because we realize this is a really good solution for uh, adjacent segment Maybe. disease. And yeah. so the, the dominoes, the connectors, the ease of them doing it through a small incision, it's all going to be way better than what we currently have. Beautiful. Um, I'm going to um, just, um, can I take the screen for a minute, Dr. Gum? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. And, um, just um, thank you again for um, thank you again for uh, your presentation uh, for uh, sharing um, sharing your experience with us uh, your passion with the uh, cortical screws um, we are in the process of uh, relaunching it in Latin America so we want um, our, our friends and customers and surgeons across Latin America to, to get exposed to your experience. Uh, and um, we really appreciate your, your uh, time and uh, patience to answer questions and put this presentation together. Um, and thank you also to everyone to join us, to spend uh, an hour with us this afternoon. And um, we hope you have a great night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Gant. Bye now. Thank you for it. Bye.